Welcome to our adult education regarding the Eucharist. As I reflect on the Eucharist, I also think about the fact that every person is in need or in search for spirituality. We look for depth and meaning beyond ourselves. And we call this the God factor. If you look at the history of humanity, God has revealed himself in three different ways. The first one I find is that we see the extravagance of God in creation. In a previous life, I did a favour of scuba diving, and uh, it's not me, by the way, that person has too much hair. But it's, it shows the magnificence of what God creates and the beauty of God, and it reflects God to us. Uh, this is a picture I took when we were flying to the South Island of uh, um, not Tasmania, uh, New Zealand. Uh, I was going on a hike over the mountains, and again, it reminded me of the Psalms. The second way in which God reveals himself or herself to us is through human activity, particularly the gift of life. And as parents, you would know that you have a sacred duty of care to look after your children, to bring them up well, but also to give and to develop that spiritual dimension to their lives. The third aspect of this is different religions in which God reveals himself or herself. And of course, we have a Judeo-Christian Christian understanding of that. To belong to the Christian Catholic faith, of course, that belonging begins with baptism. And in baptism, as you can see, we make sacred vows to God. It's not to the priest, it's to God himself or herself. And we pray and we promise and we exchange sacred vows to say that we will bring up our children in the practice and knowledge of the spiritual and of God. And it's the foundations of our faith in Christianity from a sacramental perspective. After baptism, of course, we have reconciliation, which we're not going into today, but we have the Eucharist. The Eucharist itself, which we'll talk about over four sessions, this is the first one, it's a sacred liturgy, and it really is, is where we manifest the sacredness of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why we come to Mass and ask people to come to Mass is so that their spiritual aspect of their lives is developed. We manifest the Spirit, the presence of God, and we ask that that presence may be increased within us and fortify us in the world in which we live. So if we come to Mass and we sit there asleep, or bored, or thinking about lunch, then that aspect doesn't take place because we're not being part of this conversation between God and humankind. So to make the, the Spirit manifest and to increase our faith and to fortify us, we have to engage in what is happening in Mass. And so we talk about Eucharist for now and in. This is the structure of the Mass, and it consists of two parts, as you can see in our diagram here. The first is the Liturgy of the Word, and the second, as you can see, is the Liturgy of the Eucharist. This morning, I'm going to focus on the introductory rite, and maybe a little bit on the Word, but mostly on the introductory rite, because I feel it is terribly important, and often it's, it's misunderstood or even looked over. As you can see from our diagram, the liturgy, uh, the introductory rite, is terribly important. And so maybe if I can explain it to you in this way. We come to Mass and we gather and so we pray. And as you know, the priest walks down the aisle, kisses the altar, etc. And he prays and he says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So what I want to do now is break that open for you and maybe explain it in a better way. The introductory rite consists of, obviously, an introduction, a penitential rite, and an opening prayer. The introduction is where the priest welcomes people on behalf of God. And as I said, the first thing the priest does is blesses himself. And the blessing is a real statement. As I said, it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I just want to break that open a little bit and explain maybe some of the depth involved. 
We start with the second one, the love of God. Well, that's manifest, and we saw the three revelations of God, which I talked about at the beginning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, another word for grace is gift. So we have the love of God, we have the gift of Jesus Christ, which we're going to celebrate in the Eucharist. And then we have the communion of the Holy Spirit. I find communion an interesting word. In the old liturgy, it was fellowship. We use the word communion, but actually you have to go back into the Latin. And the word is communitas. Communitas in the Latin is interesting. It says that which binds us or unites us at our deepest core. If I were to ask you what does it mean to be an Australian, you probably couldn't verbalise that too easily. It would be difficult. And yet you know you are at your deepest core. It, it's part of your identification. It, it moulds you and shapes you and it's just natural. It's who you are. And what the communitas of the Holy Spirit is saying that in our inner core, we are united with God. God seeks us out. That there's something within us that makes us needful of the grace and presence of God. There's something within us that talks to us at our deepest level. There's a connection that we cannot break no matter how we try. It's almost like genetic, spiritual geneticism. That idea we're united with God. And so if we look at the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, it really tells us what the whole Eucharist is about in, in just those words. And so it's something worth reflecting on, that idea of communitas, that which binds you and unites you and cannot be broken, like the love a parent has for a child. You can't separate yourself from that. When we look at the, um, the penitential rite itself, it's interesting. Because it comes in three sections, usually. The penitential rite can manifest itself in different ways. We can use silence, we can use symbols, we can use water, we can use a song, we can use whatever we like actually for the penitential rite. But usually at Mass on Sundays, what we have is the three prayer yeah. Lord of mercy, Christ of mercy, Lord of mercy. So, and what that's doing, it's telling us that we need to reflect on the past week and let it go. And a good example is uh, that idea that often I know myself, I'm not the best in the morning. And I would imagine that some parents can be cranky in the morning, as with some children. It's part of being human. And when we come to Mass, we need to leave all that baggage behind. All that stuff that uh, is naturally a part of who we are. And so the penitential rite invites us to get rid of that. And, and God is saying to us, that really doesn't matter. That's just being human. So a penitential rite might be, just for an example, Lord, we ask for the gift of peace in our lives. Lord, have mercy. And everybody responds by saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, we ask your blessings on the gift of, of struggle that we might find, that that struggle might give us hope and perseverance. Christ of mercy. And we always say Christ of mercy. And Lord, we ask your blessing is upon us for the future week. And we say, Lord, have mercy. And then we say, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. After that, we have the opening prayer, which I'll talk about in a minute. The penitential rite is interesting. Because what it is, and most people don't understand, is it's about coming into the presence of God. And often those things that annoy us and drive us mad about ourselves and about our others, we can bring them to Mass on a Sunday and they stop us from being present. As I say, it might have been the row we had in the morning. And so the penitential rite invites us to stop so we can hear the word of God. The other aspect of the penitential rite, which I'll go to here, if I have it right, there you go. Um, again, there's another example here. Lord, we have sinned against you, Lord have mercy. Lord, teach us your ways, Christ have mercy. Lord, send us your blessing, Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. What you'll notice about that is it's conversational. 
So Mass is not about private prayer. You can do that anywhere. Now part of Mass is, don't get me wrong, and there's parts where we need to be quiet and reflective. But this part isn't. This part is a welcome and an introduction and it's a conversation. So if you look at it properly, it does a few things. It invites us to belong to each other. If you notice, it's all plural. Lord, we have sinned against you. Lord, teach us. Lord, send us your blessing. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, bring us to everlasting life. Interesting, it's plural. And it's a conversation between us and God. And it's really telling us there is no shame, we're all the same. And I think that's very, very true. So the penitentiary right is, its function is to let go of those ordinary things, to come into the presence of God, and to prepare ourselves to hear God's word. Now, if we rush into Mass and the penitential rite is almost over, we miss that. And we miss that aspect and that ability to be quiet and still. And our mindset is probably after the Gospel. And so we miss what the word has to say to us. What we do, so it's very important that people come to Mass on time and early. I say that time and time again. And this is why. Because you miss so much of this of being still, connecting with God, and letting go of those ordinary things that we all commit, so that we can hear what God has to say. And then we say, let us pray. And a prayer might be, Lord, we ask your blessings upon us. Notice the plural again. We ask that we may be people who bring joy and hope for each other. Forgive us failings and grant us your peace. And we make our prayer through Christ the Lord. Notice it's all plurals. And notice what it does is the, the opening prayer, it closes the introductory right, and it opens us up to listen to God's word. So it's a bit like a swivel joint. It does two things. And that's terribly important because now that we've been still, we've quietened ourselves, we've let go of the weak, we're now in tune to hear what God has to say. And so we open up now to the liturgy of the word.